Uh, I got the chance to spend three months living in Reykjavik last, uh, well, I guess you have to call it summer because we were there for the four days of summer, which were somewhere around the middle of May. Um, when it, the temperature got all the way up to 18, it was fantastic. Um, but uh, uh, Tallinn has kind of become a, our second home in Europe, so it's really nice to have a chance to come back. And uh, so I hope we'll have a chance to do it again next time. That display is not right, so it's going to be a problem. Let's try. I'm just curious to see what happens if I do. Just try to read. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe even if I just sort of switch to another source and then come back, maybe. That's better, incredibly enough. OK, good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you've been to one of the Dev Club talks that I've done here before, then you're probably already uh, ready for my style of doing these kinds of talks, which is going to be all about questions and answers. Um, the topic that I, the place that I wanted to start was with the idea of how can we adopt test-driven development safely, effectively, without too much disruption, without too many problems in our organizations. That can be just you as an individual, how do I start taking steps in doing test-driven development? It can be, how do I encourage the people on my team to do it? What do I do when the people on my team are perhaps a bit hostile to the idea? And all the way up to questions of, how do I encourage the rest of my organization to try this? How do I convince managers or executives that it's even a good idea to try? And what are some of the things that I can do to avoid making some of the typical mistakes that we make when we try to change the way we work? Um, and so I'd like to start there, but that doesn't mean we have to stay there. So I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of an introduction to a couple of the ideas that come from my past experience in trying to help other people adopt test-driven development. But the questions can go wherever I'm happy. So then at one point, I'll just stop. We'll gather some questions, and I'll start answering them. Uh, I'm told that uh, the best question of the night, judged by some way that I have no responsibility for, uh, will win a free beer. So there's, at least for some of you in the room, a little bit of motivation to uh, ask a good question. And if you don't drink beer, then maybe ask a good question anyway. OK? Uh, so I think the, the, well, going back to the survey answers, I guess one of the, good, one of the best places to start might be the question sort of, how do I, how do I as an individual start trying to adopt test-driven development? And let's forget about the rest of the team for now. Let's forget about the rest of the organization. And to answer this, I want to come back to the question of why I started trying to practice test-driven development myself. So um, I'm now definitely at the age where almost every story I tell starts with about 15 years ago, which makes me a bit nervous. But you know, that's the, the, the gray here is not a, an illusion. It's actually there. Um, when I started. I started professionally programming in 1997 at IBM in Toronto, Canada. And like every brand new programmer, I had no idea what I was doing, but I had the good fortune of working in a company where no mistake I made was going to have serious consequences. It's such a big company, and even the area I was working in was such a big project that the worst thing that would happen if I made a mistake is that I would be fired. I'm not going to take anyone else with me. I'm not going to put any customers out of business. I'm not going to put my employer out of business. In fact, my employer, for the most part, is not even going to notice that I was ever there. This was most, this was most clearly established to me when, after about 18 months or so of trying to figure out how to write software as a professional, I started noticing that you know, we, the way we were doing things wasn't working very well. I was making a lot of mistakes. I was fighting with testers. And I finally started reading about how to build software better. And I read fantastic little books like this gem here that I don't, I don't know that anyone, uh, let's see. This is one of those books that I think somehow never really failed to become really popular, but I found really, really good. This is from 1995. Um, and what makes this book really neat 
is that it's 201 very short articles. Each article is about a page in length, maybe, and it's actually a small book, like it's that big. At the end of every article is a reference to a related book or article. So not only do you have, you know how some thick books will have these really long bibliographies and there's references to 150 books you'll never read. This tells you exactly if you're interested in this topic, you need to read this book next. If you're interested in this topic, you need to read this book next. And so I read this book as sort of the gateway drug to reading 30 or 40 other books on the top, on general topics of software development, whether it was writing good code, uh, designing systems, user interface design, risk management, project management, um, psychology, any of those things. I just want to make sure to give my computer caffeine so it doesn't turn off. Um, so I started here, I started reading this book, and this was the first time that I sort of expressed an interest in trying to do things better. Now there's something unfortunate that happens when we first express a desire to do things better. We start to notice that the people around us don't care about doing things better. We might meet one or two or three people who do share our interest at getting better at our jobs. But for the most part, we start to notice that the world of software developers kind of splits into two categories. The people who want to get better at it and the people who want to be left alone and make, and make decent money and just do, a, it, uh, do the minimum it takes to keep their bosses from firing. And I'm not saying that because these people are better than those people. Far from it. I've kind of reached the point in my career where right now I'm trying to figure out what is the minimum I need to do to keep clients paying me money while I try to figure out what the next stage of my career is. But you know, we'll pretend I didn't say that. Um, but that, the one thing that started to happen was that I started to feel like, okay, uh, maybe what's going on around me isn't as good as it could be. I need to figure out how to make things better. And I, I, I realized that uh, it was, I had no idea how to change the behavior of the people around me. In fact, it took me a long time to realize that that's the wrong goal anyway that trying to change the behavior of the people around you is a complete waste of time. That instead, if when I started to focus on what problems do I have and what do I want to try to change about how am I working and how can I make my job more enjoyable, better, less stressful, that was really when things started to take a good turn. And so that was around the time that I, my biggest problem was that every day I would do a bunch of work. You know, I'd write a bunch of code, you know, that sort of turn the music on, put the headphones in, get into the trance, do this for four and a half hours, and then eventually realize, oh, it's close to time to go home, maybe I should see if any of this works. So then fire up the debugger. Well, first of all, run the program and it obviously doesn't work. How could it? Fire up the debugger, start stepping through, and then say, yep, mm-hmm, what? How the hell could that variable have that value? And then you utter the words that every programmer has said at least once. That's not, that, that can never happen. <laughs> so what would happen is I would rush, so the first thing is I would figure out, looking at the clock on the wall, I'm not going home at five. That for sure is gone. So fine, try to figure out what to do, maybe write some stuff down, maybe trace through the program on paper, Try to figure out what's happening, and eventually, I don't know, maybe sometime around 7.20, finally say, okay, this is as far as I can possibly go with this. It seems to work kind of okay. Maybe nobody will notice. Check everything in and go home and think, all right, job done for the day. And then I would walk in the next day, and the first thing I would see are emails from the defect tracking system saying, here are the 14 bugs you created yesterday. Because the testers, of course, are beating the crap out of my code. So, of course, I would feel horrible. Then I would start fixing bugs. Well, actually, before I started fixing bugs, of course, I'd go to the testers and try to convince them that they're not really bugs. And then when they said, no, 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 these ones are, in fact, really bugs, then I would start fixing them. And with any luck, by about 1.30 in the afternoon, I could start doing work again. Of course, really all I'm doing is... I, you know, in the afternoon I'm creating problems and in the morning when I fix defects I'm really doing work. And in the afternoon I create more problems. Everything is good, go home, next day, seven more defects. 
So then I uttered the words that every good programmer should say at least at one point in their career, which is there's got to be a better way. And that's when I went over to, and I don't even know if this website's going to work. Oh, it's Yahoo now. Okay. I actually didn't know that. So back in 1999, this was still Alta Vista because that was the search engine we used back then on, you know, Netscape Communicator. And I just said, that one test, that one web search changed my life. That was when I, and of course the, the results were probably a little different back then. But that was when I discovered JUnit and then read an early draft of the book, Extreme Programming Installed. I like to make sure, I, I, I try to remind Ron Jeffries every so often that I've read his book and never paid for it. Um, this was the book, this was the second ever book on extreme programming that answered the question, okay, extreme programming sounds really good, I understand why we should do it, how do we get started? So this was the original book that answered questions like, how do you start doing test-first programming? How do you start doing weekly planning? How do you start uh, doing acceptance tests with your customers? And so on. And this ruined my life at IBM. Because I could, from this point forward after starting to read this book, I could never go back to the way things were and there were whole groups of people at IBM with whom I could no longer work effectively because they wanted to keep things the way they were and I wanted to change how we worked. But here's the most important thing. The reason that I got to this point in the first place, the only reason why I got interested in extreme programming and then specifically test-driven development and specifically, specifically test-driven development in Java was because I would go home at 7 o'clock thinking that I had finished a good job and come back the next day and see a long list of defects. And once that happens for 5 days, 20 days, 60 days, every time I did work, I would start to doubt whether I was actually making any progress. I would reach the point where I knew I was still typing on the keyboard and words were still coming up and code seemed to kind of compile and occasionally run. But I really didn't have the feeling like I was doing anything, like I was achieving anything, like I was finishing anything. In fact, every time I thought I finished something, a tester would pop up and tell me the 10 reasons why it wasn't done. That made me hate testers and that made me hate my own work. And it actually reached the point where I had this tense feeling in my chest that as I start, what would happen is I would start to do work, I would fool myself into thinking I was making progress, I would feel that way for a few hours, and then as I was starting to get close to done that task, I would realize there's no way that I could possibly be done. What about the 12 bugs that I've put in here? I know they're in here somewhere, I just don't know where they are. And so it seemed like the closer I got to finishing a task, the more anxious I got. And because I knew there were bugs in there and the testers were going to find them, it seemed like the closer I got to the finish line, the further away the finish line ran away from me. So in that situation, how in the world could you ever feel good about your job? I'm never finishing anything. If I finish something, it's no good. And as soon as I think I finish it, I'm going to find out just how bad it is. Who could love their job in that situation? Nobody could. Depends how much you're paid. Well, so here's the thing about that. I get paid a ton of money. And the more I get paid, the faster I get annoyed with problems, not slower. In fact, what happens when you start getting paid a lot of money is that money stops being a motivator for you at all. Because if you've saved some of your money, then of course you can just say, screw it, I'm going to take a year off. So then you can, you can throw all kinds of money at me. And all that does is it moves the date where I get, too annoyed, where I get annoyed enough to quit, it moves it back a week, maybe two. Now, if you're, if you're in a particularly bad money situation, the rules are a little bit different, but if you get paid well enough for long enough, you shouldn't be in a bad money situation. That's a different discussion. I, would use, I used to say that that's a discussion over beer, but it, it can't be anymore. That's <laughs> I have a choice, beer or health. I choose health. Um, 
I like beer, but beer doesn't like me. So the important thing to take from this is not any of the colorful part of the story, but more that I adopted test-driven development because I wanted to go home and forget my work. I wanted to go home and feel like I actually finished something. I didn't want that anxious feeling in my chest anymore. I wanted, when I got closer to the, to the end of a task, to feel more confident, not less. That was the reason that I became interested in test-driven development in the first place. Now, in 1999, it was a lot easier to do that because there weren't idiot high-paid consultants like me trying to sell training to big companies who then tell you, congratulations, you're doing test-driven development starting on Monday. We're not going to tell you why, and it doesn't matter that you don't want to, it's what's going to happen. I didn't have this problem. I had a real need, I had a real physical pain feeling in my chest, and I was looking for something that would take that feeling away, and like magic, test-driven development did that for me. It's not going to do that for everyone. But the important thing for me is that I had the advantage that I met test-driven development at a time when I really needed something and it helped me. Nobody ever pushed it on me. Nobody ever told me I had to do it. So if you are just starting or thinking about starting doing test-driven development, then you are probably in a similar situation. Maybe not as extreme, but most people, when they start practicing test-driven development, do it because they know there's something about their job that they don't like, there's something about their work that they don't like, there's something about the quality of their work they don't like. It could be that they, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing decent code, but it takes me a really long time, or I'm writing code quickly, but it never feels like it works, or I seem to write code really well for the first three months of a project, and then I feel like I'm designing myself into a corner and can't get out again. You have a real problem that you're hoping test-driven development will help you solve. This is related, strangely enough, to a topic I never thought I would know anything about, and that's sales. I got into computer programming for a really simple reason. People were hard to understand. Computers would do what I tell them to do. So it seemed like a really good relationship. The funny thing is that once you start getting interested in how to make software projects and software companies better, you then have to get into the horrible realm of psychology. And sales, as we know, is merely one kind of applied psychology. If you ever want to work as an advisor of any kind, whether that's a, a person in a leadership position within a company or a consultant, or even just a contractor, a you know, hired gun, specialized skill, bring me in for six months kind of person, you're going to need to know something about sales. And this is by far the best book I've ever read on the subject. Not because it's the best book about sales, but because it does one thing that works really well with my programmer mind. And so I think it might work with yours. This book describes a model for understanding how sales fail. What makes a sale not happen? And says, here are the things you might be missing. Here are, the, here are the kinds of people you have to think about. Here are the things that they're thinking about. Here are the, if, a, if a sale goes wrong, it's almost like you can, you can trace through a chart and say, aha, I forgot to do that. One of the things that I'll tell you about is what they call the personal win. So it's not enough to convince somebody about the benefits of the product or service that you're selling. And it's not even good enough for you to convince them that their company or their team really needs the benefits that you're selling them. These are all good things, but they're not enough. What's more important than all of this is to reach directly into the heart of the person you're trying to sell to and find out what it is that's going to make that person feel better. And if you can't figure out what it is that's going to make, I don't mean this, by the way, in a, in a you know, alien kind of way. I more mean, it wasn't really the best image, was it? Um, gaze into their soul, whatever it is that you want to say. But the idea that you need to find out what personal problem is it of theirs that you can solve with the thing you're selling. In my case, Nobody was selling test-driven development to me, really. I mean, I suppose you could say that the internet was trying to sell it to me, or these people who were eventually going to become consultants, like Ron Jeffries and blah, blah, blah. By writing a book, they are trying to sell a large audience on the idea. 
But it, it struck a chord with me precisely because it sounded like it would solve a real problem that I had. And that wasn't just a problem that meant that my work was kind of not as good as I'd like. It was a thing that made me feel pain every day when I went into work. A thing that made me feel like I was doing the worst job right at the end of every task. The thing that made me feel like no matter what I did, I would never be finished anything. When you can reach that point where you understand really what it is, what problem with your work or your life that something like test-driven development can solve, then you'll, you'll dive in headlong. You'll go for it. Because really, what do you have to lose? So if you're not sure whether to adopt test-driven development or you have a, a colleague who you think would benefit from test-driven development and they don't seem to be interested in starting, you need to sit and talk with them and find out what real problem they have that you think test-driven development might solve. And that's 99% asking them questions and listening to their answers and trying to understand them. And 1% saying, oh, I know exactly how you feel. I used to feel that way. When I started practicing test-driven development, it didn't solve these problems, but it solved those problems. Would you like to hear more? Now, when you're talking to you know, a colleague in your, in your company, for example, you're not in the same position that I'm in as a consultant. Right? My paycheck depends on my ability to sell to people, whereas when I was working in a company, it was more the quality of my work and the quality of my life at work depended on my ability to sell this idea to other people. So it's a different dynamic. The good news is that when money's not involved, you can do a much better job of really genuinely listening to what other people, how other people are thinking about their work and what their real problems are, and find out what is that personal win that test-driven development could give them. All right, now, the last thing I want to mention here is a really simple idea about how to, um, let's say, not how to convince people, but how to set the terms of experimenting with test-driven development within your team. So this is especially for the people in the group who maybe have already bought into the idea of test-driven development. Maybe you've been doing it yourself on, your, on side projects or in your own little part of your code base for a few months. You have the, you know, you've felt that personal win for yourself. Um, you want to see whether the rest of the team will be willing to try it. There's some hostility, but they seem to be willing, maybe. <laughs> How can we make it easier for them to say yes? And this is a really simple technique um, that any of you can try now. And it has nothing to do with test-driven development. It has everything to do with how to adopt a practice. And the way that I like to do this is to actually frame changing the way we work as an experiment. This works really well because if I come up to you and say, I want to change the way we work, Immediately, there's all kinds of fear. Who is this idiot? What is he thinking? What's his goal? How is this going to hurt me? What happens if this goes wrong? Why, is, why does he think we need to change things? Doesn't he think we're good enough? There's at least a million problems there. But by just saying, look, I have this an idea. I notice we have this problem. I have an idea how we might try to solve the problem. Are you willing to give it a shot? Now, as an open-ended question, it's very easy to say no. It's just very easy to say, look, I, I, I kind of see that it kind of makes sense what you're describing, but I really don't know what to do, and, and it just, uh, let's just keep doing what we're doing. There's two aspects to this. One of them is related to motivation. Yet more psychology. But again, with my programmer's mind, I like to have ideas about psychology that are really easy to describe as simple models. Motivation consists of three things. So a person will be motivated to do something if, first, they feel capable of doing it. They feel like they can follow the steps, they can follow the recipe, they can learn the techniques, they can use the tools, they can figure out how to do what needs to be done. And if they can't figure it out, then they can buy training, they can get training from somebody else, whatever it takes. The second thing is they need to be able to foresee the results. 
I need to have a pretty good idea in my head what will happen if I do this thing you are proposing that I do. And the third thing, the thing that we often overlook, is they have to want those results. Because it's entirely possible that you're pitching an idea to them and you have in your head these wonderful positive results that you foresee and of course want, but they have in their head some negative results that they can foresee that they don't want. This is especially true, for example, in the old tale of the testing department that sabotaged the programmers learning test-driven development because they were afraid that if the programmers got good at test-driven development, then they wouldn't need the testers anymore. And the testers would lose their jobs. Not quite true. A better answer is that as the programmers learn test-driven development, they make fewer silly mistakes and they tend to make more interesting mistakes, which makes the tester's job more interesting, which could also be harder. That testing becomes more than just following a test script and pressing buttons and looking at fields and, and checking at 27, 13, red. But actually having to explore the product, really figure out what's going on, find problems and so on. So if, if someone is not motivated to do something that you think they should, and even you think that they think that they should, right? This, this solution seems to fit a problem that based on what I know about you, you have this problem. This thing obviously solves that problem. It's worked for me, it's worked for him, it's worked for her. Why won't you do it? Why did it take me 15 years before I actually lost a bunch of weight and I'm keeping it off? Well, it had to do with this. So in my case, I'd gone through the exercise of losing 55 pounds, or about 25 kilograms, twice in the 1990s. But I lost 25 kilograms, gained back 35. Lost 25 more, gained back 40. And then kept gaining and kept gaining until one day, I woke up and I was 140 kilograms and thought I was going to die soon. Now, even that did not motivate me to start losing weight. Here's why. The times that I tried to change the way I eat, what had happened in the past was everything would go fine, but of course there would be certain foods that I wouldn't eat. After about eight or nine months, it's like pressure was building up. And finally I just said, screw it, I'm ordering pizza. And as soon as I did that, I would have it again the next day, and then beer, and then all the other stuff that made me fat to begin with. So part of the reason why I spent 15 years not trying to lose weight was because I didn't think that I had a way of eating that would work for me. So you could think of it as I wasn't capable, I didn't know what I needed to do, or you could think of it as I could foresee a result that I didn't want, which is in less than a year, I'm just going to get so tired and so cranky that I'm just going to give up anyway. And that's when I happened to, that's when some of my friends read Four Hour Body with the idea that you eat according to a strict diet six days a week and on the seventh day you eat whatever the hell you want. And it sounds crazy, it sounds like it's not going to work, but it fixed one key problem for me. So if I can eat whatever the hell I want on the seventh day, then that pressure build up over eight, nine months, that's not going to happen. It's like a release valve every week. And then something amazing happened. I ate really well for six days, and on the seventh day, I ate pizza and french fries and ice cream and samosas and all kinds of crap. And by about six in the evening, I felt terrible. But that's okay. That's just part of the price of eating fun food, right? So then six days of eating well, and on the seventh day, pizza, beer, onion rings, ice cream, samosas. Six o'clock, felt like crap. By the third week, I actually started to get sick literally vomiting. Finally, after six weeks of going through this, it hit me, the genius of this, eat whatever you want on the seventh day. It's retraining me to hate the food that hates me. So finally, after six weeks, I just said, you know what, this Saturday, I'm not going to cheat. Because in the past, it was, I, can, I get to have pizza in three days. Ooh, I get to have pizza in two days. I can wait two more days for pizza, no problem. By the sixth or seventh week, I genuinely didn't want that stuff anymore. So then I would cheat every 10 days, and then every two weeks. And then only when we were going through airports, because in airports it's hard to get good food. Unfortunately for me, that was every three days for a couple of weeks, but anyway. 
So what slowly happened was that as I retrained, as I retrained my body, I became less and less interested in those foods, and then I would cheat less and less frequently. And now, I mean, I, you know, my last beer was 98 and a half weeks ago. Uh, slowly, I started to give up foods because I didn't want them anymore, not because I was trying to avoid them, because I was using willpower. So I didn't even realize it at the time, but this idea of this cheat day was what filled in the gap in motivation. Because of course, I wanted the results. I wanted to lose the weight. And I knew that if I ate a certain weight, I would lose weight. But one of the other consequences is that after eight or nine months, I just say, screw it, I need pizza. So this idea was what filled in the last little bit of a gap. So when somebody is not doing something that you know is genuinely good for them, that you know that they know is genuinely good for them, you need to look for the thing that's missing. Either they're not sure what to do, like they don't know how to do it, or they're not sure what's going to happen, or they're worried about something that's going to happen. And again, ask them, figure out what it is that's getting in the way, and once you take away that last problem, once you take away the gap in motivation, it works like a charm. So this can help you understand when a team is ready to try to adopt test-driven development, as well as any other practice. Now, the, the next problem is the whole, OK, but if I start doing this and things go badly, you're going to keep making me do it even though things are going badly. Or the opposite. If we start doing this and it's going well, that guy over in the corner who doesn't want to do it will keep saying, ah, we should stop anyway. Ah, we should stop anyway. Right? Because there's always going to be people at both ends of the spectrum. There are the people who don't believe it even if the results are good, and there are the people who will believe in it even if the results are bad. And we want to do something to sort of fix both ends of that spectrum. This stupid technique works excellent for that. Remember that we want to propose changes to the way we work as an experiment. So I've, developed, I've learned a template for how to phrase that experiment in a way, and this template works. And I know that when people push these kinds of things, you should always question it. But as a beginner, this is a way to get started, and you'll figure out how to do this better over time. Every experiment is a proposal. Therefore, we have to start with I propose. It's really important that you frame this as I am asking the group to consider doing something. Not we should, not we have to, I propose. Right off the bat, what you're saying to them is, if you say no, that's OK, I'll shut up. But wait, there's more. I propose we do test-driven development. So of course, we have to say, what is the thing that we're going to introduce? That we start doing test-driven development, that we start uh, having daily stand-up meetings, that we start releasing uh, features every two weeks, whatever the thing is that you want to add. I'll stick with test-driven development because that's what we're here to talk about. Now, it's not good enough just to say, I propose we do test-driven development. Again, so, uh, these guys are going to give up even though it's working. These guys are never going to give up even when it's not working. When? On all new features and to fix all defects. Of course, if you're a grown-up, you don't say defects, you say mistakes. Because that's what defects are, mistakes we made. So it's not enough just to say what we're going to do, but when. It's important to specify the conditions under which we do the new thing. Because doing the new thing could be hard. And doing, it, doing the new thing all the time could be hard. I certainly don't propose that you ask people who've never done test-driven development before to start by doing test-driven development to fix defects in their most difficult legacy system. In fact, if you want them to hate test-driven development, give them that experiment. They'll hate test-driven development. They'll hate the legacy system, and they will hate you more than them combined. <laughs> Deservedly so. One of the difficult things about the way that I, the, the, the engagements that I do, the training engagements that I do, is that trying to do TDD with legacy code is the hardest problem my clients have to solve, and it's the hardest way to learn how to do test-driven development. It requires the most knowledge of the most tricks. It's really hard to get started. So. That's why I often say, well, let's try new features and to fix mistakes. So if we're going to pop one of the defects off the, 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 the queue and start fixing it today, we're going to use test-driven development to write that fix, which starts with 
let's write one failing test that shows the defect. It fails because of the mistake. So I propose we do test-driven development on all new features and to fix all mistakes for the next three months. We have to have a bounded time experiment. This is especially important for the people who want to give up even if the results are good. Right? The person in the corner who says, this is a stupid idea, I don't know why we're trying to do this, and I'm just going to do everything I... If I sit here and wait long enough, this fad will die and we can get back to real work. If you have that person on your team, probably you do, then by saying that we're going to do this for three months, when they object, you can look them right in the eye and say, look, I think I could actually do three months in prison and survive. Surely you can do three months of test-driven development. <laughs> it's only three months, you'll be fine. And if it turns out that it's not working, it'll go. Now, we need to choose a long enough period of time that we actually have a chance for, to see good results. And in the case of test-driven development, I would say three months is kind of the minimum. And if we really can't afford to experiment with this for three months, then that means you haven't found the personal win for the people on the team yet, or for the manager who might be approving this experiment. Then it's time to dig and to find out maybe there's a deeper problem that we need to solve with a different idea. The good news is that when you find out what that thing is, you can use the same template to propose an experiment to do something about that problem. Now it's not enough to say we're going to do test-driven development on all new features and defect fixes for the next three months because we need to have some way of measuring success. We have to have a way of agreeing that things are getting better. So, with the goal of reducing the arrival of new defects, we have to pick one way of measuring the impact of our change. And it's important that it be one, not three, not five, but one. We want to reduce the likelihood of arguing about the results. And if there are three things to measure, and two of them are better, and one of them is worse, then that guy in the corner who doesn't want to keep going will point to the one that got worse and say, but that one's more important than the other two combined. And it's an argument that is not worth time, having the, or not worth the energy to have. By saying that there's one thing we're going to measure for success, even if it's not the perfect thing to measure, it reduces the arguments at the end of the experiment, did we improve or not? Of course, this has to be tied to something that the team finds important, right? Because that's the result that you foresee, and they need to want that result. And if they don't, they're not going to accept your experiment. Now, it's not enough just to say we're going we're to ship fewer defects. By 60% over last release. It's important, crucial, critical to have a binary condition here. It's either yes or no. So you need to pick a number. It needs to be something where we can definitely all agree we did it or we didn't do it. This is really important for a reason I'll come back to in a moment. Now, the, this isn't enough even to do all this. The last part is perhaps the most important part. If we succeed, then the experiment automatically renews For six months. Usually I like this to be double that period. Otherwise, we stop. So the stakes of the experiment are simple. If we reach our goal, then we keep going. And we agree to do it for twice as long as we did the first time. Presumably, it's giving us good results, so we should keep going. But if we don't reach our result, we stop the experiment. But Joe, you're wondering, what if we reach 58%? What if we reduce our defect rate by 
Are you really saying that we shouldn't do test-driven development anymore? Not at all. Here's what I think will happen. So here's our team. I'm proposing the experiment to our team. And over at one end, we have the one person who thinks that the test-driven development is a horrible idea, that it's going to cause us nothing but pain and suffering, and who will try to sabotage our every move. Thank you. <laughs> at this end, we have the person who absolutely, the other person besides me who absolutely loves test-driven development and is committed to practicing test-driven development whether it makes our situation better or not. The other three are uh, varying degrees in between. So now let's play the experiment game and see what happens. So we run the experiment. We end up reducing our defect rate by 62% over the last release. The experiment automatically kicks in for another six months. I'm happy. Vico's happy. Probably the three in the middle are happy enough to keep going. If Valeri is not happy, so one of two things will happen with Valeri. Either he'll be convinced. You guys were right, I was wrong, it happens, beer is on me. For me, red wine, please. Or he says, I don't care, it was luck, blah, 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 blah. If in the case of cold hard facts that show that the experiment is working, he refuses to continue, this is the time when we say, okay, let's go talk to our manager and find out about moving you to another team. And it's not because I don't like you and it's not because you don't like me, it's because we can't work together. Forcing people to work together who want to work in a fundamentally different way is cruelty. We shouldn't do it. But rather than argue about it every single day and have you subtly trying to sabotage him and him subtly trying to sabotage you, we decide it with an experiment once and for all and we agree this is how we're going to decide how we will uh, continue. And if he's genuinely not convinced, fine. Then it's time, you know, we just, we can't be on the same team anymore. We can still go out for drinks on Friday, but we can't be on the same team. Let the five of us continue on with what we're doing. Okay, now let's roll back the clock and let's try again. What happens if it's 59%? And in a reference to a movie that most of you won't get, I will say 59 is not 60. The film is Eight Men Out. If you're a baseball fan, you will have seen it. And if you're not, you won't and you won't care. 59 is not 60. The experiment ends. You're thrilled. Right? Because you still think TDD is a bad idea. You're not convinced by it at all. You were worried that we were going to reach the goal and they were going to force you to change the way you want it to work. So you're glad that's over. Now you can sit there and say, ha ha, I told you so. Of course, we're really upset because we came so close. Now, what about these three in the middle? What's the most likely action? The most likely case is that they're mostly convinced that it was a good idea they feel bad that we barely missed our goal and are probably willing to try again. Because although it says here we stop, it doesn't say, and we never do this again. <laughs> what it says is, Valeria is within his rights to refuse to renew the experiment. But we are well within our rights to propose another experiment. Maybe with a different goal, maybe with a different, uh, maybe with a different measurement of the goal, Maybe for a different period of time. Maybe the problem was that so many of our defects were so difficult to recreate or to reproduce that trying to do TDD on fixing old defects is a bad idea. So maybe we change this to, we're only going to use it to fix recent defects. And for old defect fixes, just do whatever you can do. If you have to kill a chicken, that's fine. <laughs> so then we repropose the experiment. Now, what happens? Probably we all support the experiment, but of course we never run an experiment if somebody on the team truly objects. So if in spite of all this, Valeri still says, no, I'm not doing it. Once again, now it's time. Let's go talk to the manager and figure out what to do. And let the manager decide whether they want to keep this group together but not get good benefits from a practice that's obviously working well, if not as well as we thought or if it's time to move Valeri on to a new team and replace him with somebody who wants to work the way we want to work. By the way, the other answer could be just to fire the five of us. Give Valeri all the money and say, if you're so good at what you do, teach it to the rest of us. We have to allow for that possibility. So let's go back to the template. I propose we do this practice in these situations for this long. 
with the goal of some kind of performance improvement by at least this much. If we succeed, then the experiment automatically renews for twice as long. Otherwise, we stop. But reserve the right to propose a similar experiment later. This really works. It works because the people who want to, the people who never want to give up know that if they just hold their breath for three months, it'll all be over. And again, you can use that classic line to them, look, I can survive three months in prison, you can survive three months doing acceptance tests with our customer. For the person who will never give up, who believes and believes even when it's not working for us, then say, look, we had three months, we didn't meet our goal, what are you gonna do? Maybe we need to try something else first. Maybe TDD is good for us, but maybe we have a deeper problem that's getting in our way, and if we solve that problem first, then in six months we can try TDD again. Let's try and find out what that problem is. So this is the way that I help teams install test-driven development with each other in a way that respects everyone on the team, that respects the people who are skeptical, the people who are maybe overly enthusiastic, and as well as makes it clear, you know, not only is this about, you know, handling the differences between Vico and Valeri, but it's also about making sure that everyone on the team knows what's happening. They have a specific experiment that I can, they can either agree with or not agree with, that they can buy into or not buy into. And if it succeeds, then we know that it was a meaningful success. And if it fails, then instead of saying, oh, we should have done it harder, which is what will happen, right? If we just say, let's do TDD, and after four months, things aren't getting better, then Vika will just say, well, you guys aren't believing enough. If you just believe more, we'll get more results, right? It doesn't work. It could be the case where we're the one, so I, it, it, you're laughing pretty hard at this, so I, are you the guy who does this at work? No, okay. Um, so what you're doing is you're making it clear to everybody what are the terms of trying to change the way we work, how do we know that it's helping, and what do we do with the result? If the result means this, we keep, we keep going and we learn more and we try new things, uh, or we go deeper, and if the results aren't what we expect, then we agree, it was a nice try, let's not continue investing time and energy in something that's not working, let's try to find something else. All right. That actually was much longer than I expected. So I'm gonna do a quick time check. When am I off stage? Three minutes ago? Let's uh, say five minutes more. Five minutes more, okay. Let me think for a moment. Okay, so one other tool that you're going to need in your toolbox, possibly, is this one. So this book is about understanding how people learn to work together as a team. And again, it's great for my programmer mind because it's a model of you need this, then you need this, then you need this, then you need this. The very first, uh, the very first rung on the ladder, if you will, is related to trust. That one thing that keeps people from working together as a team is that they don't trust each other enough. And so there's five, five parts of this model, and it's a very easy way to understand why people aren't working well as a team, so that you can start to try to figure out how can we help them work better as a team. Um, in a very, this is an example of building trust. So proposing this experiment as opposed to just saying, hey, let's start doing TDD. Do you agree? Great, let's give it a shot. For us to just say we're gonna start doing TDD requires an awful lot of trust. It requires that we all be open to the possibility that this change is going to work. We also have to be open to the possibility that it won't work. We have to agree that we're all going to give it a certain amount of effort. I have to believe that you're going to give it your best effort. You have to believe that I'm going to give it my best effort and so on. In a low trust environment, that's very risky. Especially if we compare the two people at the opposite ends of the spectrum. They'll probably not trust each other. If the results aren't good, 
then Vico will assume that Valeri is sabotaging things. And if the results are too good, then Valeri will assume that Vico is cooking the books. So what we need is a way <coughs> of establishing trust within that kind of environment. And one of the ways to do that is to be very clear about what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, how we're going to measure success, and what the result will mean. So this, in addition to being a good way to adopt practices in a team, is also a good way to help building trust within a lower trust environment. It's not a particularly fast way of doing it, but it's a good way of doing it. Okay, I think that's all I have to say, and I, I, so I will try to take, I suppose if I take three questions, then that will be enough to judge that one of them was better than the other two. So, now we're gonna do some ultra thin slicing. I'm gonna take three questions in a row first, and then I'm gonna try to answer them in a row. So, let's start here. Why are you so sure that you can survive for three months in prison and post your junior um, director? Oh, Should we just give him the beer now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll take, I'll take three more questions in a moment. So the short answer is, I don't well play. All right. Yes? Uh, the numbers you showed, like three, three months, and yeah. 60% uh, increase or decrease. That's yes. Are these uh, realistic things you have seen? Or, uh, what's the yeah. Okay, next question. So I'll answer all three in a row. Say again? And third question. Yes? So can I do TDD when my team won't? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so the answer of whether the uh, potential reduction in defects is realistic for the average team is impossible to answer. Uh, every team is completely different. Have so, you seen them in real life? I've seen, I've, I, well, when I practiced test-driven development myself, here's what I did. I went from, uh, I went from in a three-month period having over 40 defects reported by testers, not fixing them all, and not finishing the features that I needed to build, to, and I'm not joking, I went home, I told my manager, let me go home, I've got three weeks, let me build the whole component again from scratch, I'm going to use test-driven development, and I'll come back when it's done. And if it's not done in three weeks, you can fire me. I really, this is a true story. I went home, I worked <laughs> nine 14 hour days. I wrote 127 tests. By the end, it took 12 minutes to run the tests because of course it was on a Pentium 90. So I was writing tests for about 120 hours in addition to writing the code. Zero defects, feature was complete. And that, if you, uh, if you translate it out to normal eight hour days, it's about three weeks of work. So, four months of work, didn't finish the features, 40 defects, do it again, three weeks of work, no defects found by testers. So, that's a 100% reduction in the, the arrival of new defects. So, let's, let's call it 90, because maybe there's a couple of bugs that nobody found. So, that's certainly possible. But that's a lot easier in a project where you're working on your own. So what really matters here, the three months I think is important that it at least be three months. It takes, it takes, it certainly you won't get the results that you expect in three weeks or four weeks or five weeks. Because in the first two weeks you're learning how to write a test. In the next two weeks you're kind of learning how to write code in small chunks and it takes a while. So I would say three months is kind of a minimum length for specifically experimenting with TDD. But um, if you're not sure what to put here, reach for the moon, man. I mean, what do you really want? 80%, 90%, 70%, 60%? The important thing is that this number is high enough that when we reach it, Valeria can't say bullshit. So let him choose the number. And if he says, I, 
I don't care unless we reduce defects by 80%, then you say, fine, 80%. If we only get to 65, then again, we repropose the experiments without valid. <laughs> so, <laughs> does test driven development double the budget compared to what? Both right. So remember that test driven development includes test, includes not all of testing, but includes a large portion of testing, all of coding, and a large portion of design. We're still going to do some design decisions before we write code, but if you think about all the design documents that we would spend two months writing, those are gone. That happens in one week now. So if you compare test-driven development to the design phase plus the coding phase plus some large portion of the testing phase, maybe 40% or 50%, then test-driven development will almost always be cheaper. You have to be really bad at test-driven development for it to cost more. If you want to compare test-driven development to just the coding part of your old process, it'll look more expensive. But it's only more expensive the first time you do it. Now, going back to my story where I redid four months of work in three weeks and reduced defects by 100%, this was with only three months of experience part-time trying test-driven development out on hobby projects. Imagine how much faster. I'm pretty sure that the thing that I built in four months that I could take one of you, go up to a hotel room in four days, we can finish the whole thing. So test-driven development, once you've learned it and mastered the basics, uh, it will always be cheaper. Can I do test-driven development when my team won't? Yes and no. If you try to do test-driven development in, and the rest of the team changes nothing about what they do, eventually what will happen is you'll say, hey, someone needs to refactor this code. They're not refactoring, so I'll do it. And then they'll say, hey, I don't have to refactor code. He'll do it. And then you become the refactoring butler. You might as well wear a bow tie <laughs> and say, my job is, that's OK, guys. You shit, I'll shovel. It's fine. <laughs> so in order to do test-driven development when the rest of the team won't, what you end up doing, the answer is crappy but true. What you end up doing is figuring out, here's my part of the code base. The rest is the teams. I'm going to set up a wall of interfaces. <laughs> right? So I will fish in this side, and you'll fish on that side, and nobody will fish in the middle. Whenever I have to touch code out here, I expect that I'm going to do it with a lot of this. <laughs> But inside here, this is what I like to call the warm, dry place. <laughs> this is the happy zone where I get to do real good work. Now, now it becomes a game of risk. Because now, after you have practiced in here, your next job is to try to annex a little bit more, <laughs> and a little bit more, and a little bit more, until eventually you own the whole board. And what will probably happen is, one of two things will happen. Either everyone will see how good your job is going and will start to ask you, how are you doing it? And you'll teach them, and slowly but surely, you'll convert the team. Or they'll say, I hate this guy. He's making me look bad. You can either take those skills to a new team that appreciates you better or to a new company that appreciates you even more. All right, that's definitely all I have time for.